Welcome to Digital Asset News, to get top stories in crypto. Yeah, I'm bringing on a bite-sized piece. Today, just like the thumbnail suggests, we're going to talk about three potential reasons for this sell-off. And the first thing I want to do is just talk about and give you a little bit of a perspective about what's going on and pretty much where we are uh, in what I think is this cycle. Then we're going to talk about the three different reasons for sell-off or dips, whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to get to a little good news and take a look at what is going on in the market overall to give us just a little bit of hope. So first of all, let's take a look at what's going on in the market today. And it's... Uh, it's one of those days. So we dipped below 2 trillion. So we lost about 200 billion. Ah, 200 billion. What are you going to do? Call it a Tuesday. Uh, if you're from the traditional markets, don't worry. This will happen again. But we'll also uh, go up again because we are extremely volatile. And that's why we play in this space. So right now, 1.94 trillion. And everything across the board is just down. So I don't really take, need to take a look at the coins per se. But if we had to, we can just say that Bitcoin's just under 44,000. We've got Ethereum. Uh, hovering around 3,000, might even go in the twos. Cardano down to uh, down 9% at $2, and everything uh, is pretty much in the red. And that's pretty much what it is. So this is uh, nothing new, and this is normal. So when we take a look at these things, it would be kind of concerning if we weren't so hardened to what is going on in the crypto market. If you are new, uh, just stick around because uh, crypto market is like the weather. If you don't like it, just uh, just hang around for a couple of days. It'll change. It'll change dramatically. And that's why I take a look at a little bit of perspective. And when I think about this, I just think about all the different ups and downs we've all gone through, right, in this market. Mm -hmm. And one of those things I always like to talk about is Peter Lynch, and he says this. He goes, look, far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections that has been lost in corrections themselves. So yes, uh, you know, beforehand we could have uh, taken a little bit out, taken some profits, which we all should do. I'm not telling you what to do. This is investment opinion, not investment advice, but I have taken profits along the way for days like today when things go down and you can do whatever you want with that, with that dry powder. You can buy into the dip, you can buy more assets, or you can just hold on to it. Whatever you want to do, it's up to you. My goals are not your goals, and that is just the truth. So we take a look at that like, well, okay, so maybe I shouldn't sell everything and uh, run for the hills and scream that the sky is falling. Also, I want to give a little bit of uh, uh, more of uh, perspective. This is from my man uh, Dave at Crazy for Cryptos, Digital Dave, and he said this. <laughs> I love this picture. The end is near. And every time there is a big dip, you're going to hear the, the media shouting from the rooftops. The end is near. The end is near. The end is near. The end is near. Bitcoin's dead. Bitcoin's dead. Bitcoin's dead. And of course, what happens? It turns around to like, ah, we told you the whole time. It's going to go up to the moon. It's going to be crazy. Before you know it, it dips again like, ah, end is near. So it's the same thing repeating itself over and over again. And also, on top of that, we take a look at uh, uh, my friend, uh, what is going on here in the market sell-off. So this is actually uh, the very first part I wanted to get into. And uh, friends of the show, Squawk Box, uh, they are talking about what could potentially happen. And this is what I like to call uh, the first dip reason. So let's take a listen to what they are talking about right here. Lots of pressure on the markets this morning. And Mike Santoli uh, joins us now with more. Hey, Mike. Hey, Joe. Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, the decline we've seen in September becoming maybe slightly less orderly this morning with a lot of things going on overseas, a lot of things kind of built up behind the dam, debt ceiling concerns, whatever you want to talk about. Here's the uh, S&P 500 ETF, the SPY, which does show the uh, early morning pre-market action, kind of takes us back to really below the August lows. That's what we're first gauging right now is where the August low is going to hold. Looks like we're right around there at the open. If you remember on Friday, the uh, S&P 500 closed below its 50-day average. It had done that a handful of times this year. We're not bouncing right off at this particular week, the September week after options expiration. Very consistently weak uh, over the past 20 years or so. So this is all in the backdrop. And, uh, you know, it takes us, like I said, back a little over a month uh, and to levels first reach back in uh, in July. So obviously, we're, we're having a little bit of a spill back here. Take a look at the S&P versus the equal weighted Russell 3000. So this is basically the average stock in the overall market. And this is on a year to date basis. It shows you that the rally into the highs uh, into early this month was very much mega cap driven. So here's the S&P 500 in white that was continuing to increase into early uh, October, uh, early September. And whereas the equal weighted actually have been lower even before today's open. So this has been a story, right? It's been mega cap growth stocks that have been unable now to support the market, but they did kind of contribute a lot on the way up. Look at the global picture. 
Even before today, the rest of the world was struggling, and it wasn't just China. Take a look at the S&P 500 against IFA. That's, you know, developed markets overseas. And then this is emerging markets without China. So emerging markets ex-China, it shows you the S&P 500 built up this huge lead uh, starting in the summer. So again, narrowing doesn't mean we have to reconverge. I would point out that, you know, we talked about the 50-day average last September, which was the last 10% decline in the S&P 500, also preceded by a period when mega cap growth stocks were working to the exclusion of everything else. That's That bottomed eventually around the 100-day average for the S&P. That's around 4,300 right now. So Clearly, uh, a little more give back. We are, are on alert for the fact that this market is maybe changing uh, its tone a little bit as opposed to these quick bounce backs. But even at today's levels, at the pre-market levels, we're still not at a 5% pullback yet, guys. So, yeah, and that's the big thing. And then, of course, the reason why I'm talking about this is because even though we think that the crypto market, traditional market is, se is segregated, it's not. There are so many players in the traditional market and they're coming over into our space. And guess what happens? There is only one market open 24-7, 365 to hedge your bet and to uh, do sell-offs and uh, close your positions. And that is cryptocurrency. So right now, uh, even though we like the institutional investors coming here, when they're buying everything up, we got to take the good with the bad as they sell everything off because of what is going on, futures expiration and things like that. So that is uh, one of the first reasons. And also, there's another reason, which is everybody's talking about. You're going to hear this a lot today. It's called Le Grand or Ever, excuse me, Evergrande or Evergrande, however they say it. And uh, this is uh, a company uh, in China, and they are all about uh, real estate, commercial real estate. And this is from uh, friends of the show, Bobby Giggs. And uh, he put this out as a tweet. I thought it was pretty good. And if we take a look at what's going on in China, like, well, who cares about China? But you have to understand, remember back in 2008 when there was a huge housing crisis and we had a big bubble, the housing bubble, and everything collapsed here in America. I'm like, ah, we'll be okay for the rest of the world. And everything collapsed around the world as well. And this is exactly what's happening uh, as well as in China, potentially. So Evergrande's financial woes, 305 billion in debt, 7.4 billion bonds due in 2022, 75% haircut for the for bondholders, 1.5 million unfinished properties, which doesn't sound like it's that bad, but uh, they're giving uh, new homes offered with 25% off and 85% share price drop. So, uh, and then also, they told all the uh, all their debtors like, look, on Thursday, uh, there's interest due. We're not gonna pay it because we don't have it. And that's pretty much what's going on. So uh, when we talk about this, people are gonna say, well, Evergrande is one of the big things that uh, is gonna happen. And we actually had this discussion on DCA. It was me, uh, George, and James from Invest Answers and Cryptos Are Us. James thinks it's a huge issue. Uh, George thought it wasn't because he's like, who cares? China's just gonna print a bunch more money. And then, of course, they're, they're pushing the uh, digital yuan. So who cares because they're just gonna print their way out of it. I'm like, well, you can do that, but we try to do that here in America. And because we're the reserve currency, we can do those things for right now, right now. But later on, who knows? But uh, I think it could be the canary in the, in the coal mine. But again, we go back to the same thing. Farm money's been lost by preparing for a correction. So that is that piece. And then when we take a look at, whoops, uh, Evergrande's woes. There's also one more little thing coming on in the background. That's dip reason number three, which is regulation. And we talked about this ad nauseum. Uh, Gary Gensler is not going to give up, and he's pretty much going to try to uh, regulate as much as he possibly can in the crypto market. Uh, we talked about this, and this is from uh, Charles Gasparino. He's a Fox News uh, contributor, and he says, breaking people who know, I like that, breaking people who know Gary Gensler say chances of him ceding power or trying to cooperate to engage the crypto industry in a new regulatory regime or Zippo, he will seek to leverage the SEC government's power on this unless Congress on the court steps in. And then Tony from Think Crypto says, you gotta have Congress step in. And Tony's exactly right, you need to do that. So, I mean, in the hearing, which I will link that video uh, at the very end where there was a hearing with the uh, Senate Committee on Housing and Gensler said, look, he goes, with the laws that you guys have put forth over the last couple of decades and uh, the uh, Howey test, and there's another one, I forgot what it was. And uh, he says, based on that, he goes, uh, everything's a security. Basically, he said, everything's a security except for Bitcoin and Ethereum. He didn't say that specifically, but he talks about decentralization because Bitcoin's decentralized and Ethereum is mostly decentralized. We can't really do much there, but everything else, it's going to be a security. So uh, on this one, I think people and their regulatory issues are like, wow, this is pretty bad. However... So taking a look at all that, that sounds pretty awful, right? So there's a, there's three good reasons why we had a nice little sell-off. People are just scared. Well, here's some good news. And this actually yeah, comes to us, Coindesk, Coinbase, and Coinbase, 
Coinbase said Monday it's launching uh, its uh, prime brokerage product out of beta. The move could cement the exchange's leading force in institutional crypto adoption. And again, we don't like uh, institutional institutions coming here to sell. But we're okay with them buying. And you had to take the good with the bad, and it's just how it goes. And then to me, I was like, well, who cares about this? And we take a look over here. This is a nice graph from Visual Capitalist. And uh, on the very far right-hand side, you can see here, it says uh, it's 89 billion, far right-hand side. Underneath there, it says 57 billion. And you can see institutional trading volumes in Q4 2020 were five times greater than in Q1 2018, which was only 11 billion. That's that little uh, highlighted box right there. So, and that was really not much going on as far as uh, for institutions. And now we've got this nice, uh, institutional uh, uh, brokerage product out of beta. So that could lead us into more adoption. So that is a uh, good news. I will take it. And also, this is from a uh, friend of the show, George, Cryptos Are Us, like we just talked about. And he says, look, and it's great advice. He says, we're given a gift of low prices before the most bullish months of this cycle. Again, I believe quarter four is going to be pretty good in 2021. Maybe even Q1 2022. I don't know, but uh, I'm not great at timing. I can just tell you what is potentially going to happen. And he says, tremendous opportunity should not be wasted. And I have to agree with him. And actually, it's not just me that agrees with him. It's uh, me and the uh, president of El Salvador. And I always say his name wrong, Nayib Bukele. He says this, we just bought the dip, 150 new coins. El Salvador now holds 700 coins. They can never beat you if you buy the dips. This is presidential advice. So I said to myself, that's a pretty good advice. I'm going to take that advice. I'm going to run with it. And I'm going to buy a little bit on this dip. Now, uh, I've learned in the past not go all in on the first dip because maybe it's a dip within a dip within a dip. So you never know what's potentially could happen. So I just kind of space things out. These are things I bought today. And mostly because they were like on super sale, like almost like 20% down. I'm like, what the heck? So I bought uh, Algo, Avalanche, Luna, and Polka Dots, and Sol, Solana. So uh, that's what I thought was pretty good news. On top of some other great stuff. And this is from my uh, Jared. He sent this in to me. So thanks, Jared. Uh, interactive Brokers adds crypto trading. First of all, what the heck is Interactive Brokers? Interactive Brokers is an American uh, multinational brokerage firm, operates the largest electronic trading platform in the US by number of daily average revenue trade. So pretty big little business. Pretty big little business, that's funny. And uh, this is what uh, the chairman, uh, Thomas uh, Peter, Peter Fee says. Let me first ask you about the demand. What drove you to this decision? Do you have investors, um, you know, saying we have to be able to trade this asset? Yeah, absolutely. So on the one hand, we have many uh, customers who, who uh, manage uh, well-balanced portfolios, and they uh, asking with greater and greater urgency that could we please uh, add the ability to for them to gain some crypto exposure. Simultaneously, also many of our registered investment advisors keep telling us that their customers are urging them to to uh, put some crypto in their portfolios. And then, in addition, we also have you know, frequent traders who would, who have been asking us to, to enable them to, to be able to trade the, the price relationships among the various uh, different tokens and crypto futures and other crypto related assets. So it, it appears to me that, that it has become common wisdom now that everybody should have some little percentage of their assets in crypto. I like that statement right there where he said, hey, you know what? I think it's common wisdom that everybody should have exposure just a little bit to cryptocurrency and digital assets, even their RIAs. So that is uh, some more good news. Also, there's the Bitcoin logarithmic growth curves. And if we can just take a look at the bands, here's where things have been kind of in this range so far. And what we see right now, here's the price itself. Uh, looks like it's uh, September, where are we? 13, 17, somewhere around there. And these are the bands. So the low part for the end of this year is, this is the lowest, 25,000. I don't think it's gonna do that. 60,000, 61,000 at the end of the year, or potentially the high part, 145,000. 
So even if we go to 60,000, somewhere around here, 90, 100, I think that would be just okay, but I don't see quarter four being a big dud. And that is really it. So look, I know there's a lot of things going on and I just wanna give the side to the story, to every type of story that's out there so you can make the best informed decision for yourself. Now, if you like that video, give it a thumbs up, give it a like. If you also like these types of videos to help you kind of uh, get into the market or take a look at the market, consider subscribing. But that is it for today. So thanks so much for watching, I appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one.